I love Pastor Courtney. She is, we are so blessed. She's an amazing pastor. Our kids love her to death. And, and uh, you, you, she's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And the proof of that is that she loves me. So thank you, Pastor Courtney. <laughs> Take your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 6. Tonight I'm going to talk about the difference between uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And at first hand, if you know Scripture, you might go, but wait a minute, it appears in Scripture that they're inexchangeable. And uh, I want to uh, talk to you about the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament and today. And so I'm glad that you're here. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to be uh, doing uh, one more message on the Holy Spirit, and uh, I hope that you can be here on Sunday the 16th. Isaiah has a vision of the Lord and his glory. In Isaiah chapter 6, the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Um, another version is talking about it being his glory. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face, and with twain, Two, he covered his feet, and with two or twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I want you to notice they were crying one to another. Envision the picture. One, holy, holy, holy. Reply, holy, holy, holy. And all over these seraphim, these angels were crying holy back and forth as they cried out. And when you see something in triplets and threes in Scripture, it's for emphasis. It means it's most important when you see three times, holy, holy, holy. The Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And it says, as they, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Isaiah, this is Isaiah, woe is me. For I am undone. Here in your presence, we are undone. What do you have? Nothing but to fall on your face. You're undone. Nothing you have can stand. He says, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For in mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. A live coal, what does that mean? It's on fire, wasn't it? And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. You see, fire purifies. You put metal in it, it purifies, it cleanses. And uh, the Holy Spirit is known as the Holy Spirit and fire. Pastor Hawkins, I got a text from someone, and always when he preaches, I always feel like I'm never preaching again. And uh, someone was telling me how much his message helped him so much, and that makes my joy beyond measure. Uh, and uh, uh, we sure appreciate that. But he was mentioning in the version where it says, quench not the Spirit. It says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. See, there is a baptism of spirit and fire. He will baptize you, John says, with the Holy Spirit and fire. And uh, there's an element of fire that is important with the work of the spirit. And here you see it. Now notice something else akin to Acts chapter one and two. Sin purge. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Notice that. Whom shall I send? Now the Holy Spirit is there. The glory of the Lord, it filled the place. The place, is, the place is shaken. It's full of his glory in verse three. There's worship. There's the, the, the coals of fire. There's the cleansing. There's the preparation. And then God says, and Isaiah says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, the Lord was saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then, I, then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go. Acts Turn with me to the New Testament now in Acts chapter number one. Acts 
verse four, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus being with them. He said, but wait, that do not part from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, or the Holy Spirit. Um, notice the words, John baptized, but you will be baptized, all right? Now jump to Acts chapter two, and verse one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Other meaning different kinds of tongues. Notice here what the promise of the Father, it says you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, says, and they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke with tongues. Here, it appears, and I believe it to be so, that what is spoken in, in Acts chapter one, verse five, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit not many days since. And in, in Acts chapter two, verse four, where it says, and they were filled with the Spirit, it's the same thing. So it's interchangeable. So tonight, in my preposition to you, uh, I propose to you this the question. Uh, if I ask you the question, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Some of you would raise your hands and others wouldn't, but it would all depend on what you understood, the terminology, what I mean by baptized with the Holy Spirit. See what I'm saying? And so you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for instance, and uh, you can maybe think that what I'm asking you, are you born again? Because there, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, in uh, verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. See that? Or the Jews are Gentiles. So this is talking about, Paul is talking about the regeneration of the spirit. In other words, the new birth, when the Holy Spirit comes in and old things are passed away, behold, all things become new, and it's, gener it's regeneration of the Spirit or born again of the Spirit, like John records about this conversation with, uh, uh, oh my goodness, my mind is going blank, where he says, you must be born again, right? Nicodemus, yes, my mind went blank, Nicodemus. He says, well, I, how can I enter my mother's womb and be born? He says, no, I'm talking about born of spirit. That which is flesh is born of flesh. That which is spirit is born of spirit. You born of the spirit. That's what that's referring to. In Acts chapter 12, it has nothing to do with Acts chapter one, where Jesus says, baptize the Holy Spirit, or Acts 2, 4, where it says that they were filled with the spirit, even though they used two different terminologies. And and then you get to the uh, Old Testament and go back with me a minute and I'm not gonna look, have you look up scriptures but you can go to the judges. And, and God would pick s several different judges and he would go down through the judges and I mean, several of them, they were, just, they were just nothing. They were just nobody but the Spirit of God would come upon them to lead and accomplish what God had and only God sovereignly picked that and the Holy Spirit came upon them and each time you see it, it was empowerment for a task, for a calling, for an event that God wanted to take, to take place. Are you with me? All right? Notice in Acts, in Isaiah 6, he says, who will go? And in Acts chapter one, he says, and you'll be my witnesses when he says the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses unto, unto me. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he'll give you power to be witnesses that both times there's an event that's very preeminent in the mind of God, and that is that people come to Christ to be witnesses to go and give the gospel. In fact, when he says, and lo, I am with you, what, what is being with you now? Where's God the Father? 
In a sense, God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus are all here, right? But the Bible, because they're one. But the Bible does mention God on his throne and Jesus at the right hand making intercession and Jesus has sent the Spirit to be in us and among us, right? And so Jesus, when he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, he says, every time it's connected and lo, I am with you. That's when he's with us. You see, the point of the Spirit isn't feeling. It's witness, it's power to witness, to achieve a task. You see it in the Old Testament. Now the Holy Spirit didn't come to people in the Old Testament like it did now. Moses, I believe it was Moses, that wished that the Holy Spirit would come to all people. But remember, when Moses, the Spirit of the Lord, in 1 Samuel 16, it says from that point forward, I believe it's verse 11, the, the Holy Spirit was upon him. And then the Bible says that God took the the measure of the spirit that was upon Moses and put it on these others that were his helpers. Not that he divided himself in little pieces. No, the fullness of the spirit, the same spirit that was on Moses to accomplish the God-called task that Moses had was now also upon his helpers. You with me? You got Gideon, who was a nobody, scared to death. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. He completed a task. In every case, when the Holy Spirit would come upon someone in the Old Testament, it was because there was a task at hand. Jephthah, uh, Samson, even though he was ungodly and he flirted with sin, the Holy Spirit was on him. Saul, when he was anointed king, the Holy Spirit was on him. And then the Holy Spirit departed Saul and went to David, and no wonder when David sinned, he prayed, let not thy Holy Spirit be taken from me. Why? Because he needed the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's given task for what was in front of him. Do you with me? Are you with me? So there are three or four or five different ways that the Holy Spirit is upon people, in people, flows through people, empowers people, baptizes people, and we're full of him. There's all kinds of different ways. And and it's it's, it's a little bit complex. I've studied this and read on this for many years and and refreshed my reading this week. But let's let's just think of a few things about being full of something, okay? You ever said, boy, he's full of bull. He's full of himself. He's full, the Bible refers to people being full of hatred, full of anger, uh, full of jealousy, uh, full of uh, deceit. And a person can be full of a lot of different things. In our fifth grade class, the fifth graders, we talk about life, our heart, our soul being like a well, like a water well. And whatever you put into it that you allow into that well will change what the water's like, right? We, we, use the, we use water as an analogy, drinking at the springs of living water, Light, right? Flowing, clean, beautiful waters. We, we use the analogy of rain, let the rain of the Spirit come as if there is a pouring out of His Spirit raining on us. And, um, and so when we think about the, the Holy Spirit, um, in coming to us um, in, a, in, a, in different ways, one of the ways that he comes to us is by us filling our well, this water well, with godly things. Remember we talked about, in a practical way, walking in the Spirit is the practical way to live full of the Spirit. Led by the Spirit, walking the Spirit, attend of the Spirit, the Spirit being with you. All right, so how do we do that? Well, we know that when it gives us the armor of God, we need to put it on. That's part of it, right? Understanding it, putting it on, and it has to do with correct theology. Like when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, what does it mean? It means you know that it's not your righteousness. Your righteousness is filthy rags. What does it mean? It means that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus and by faith only you stand righteous with him before God. Because no matter how good a human can be, their righteousness will never measure up. 
We talk about the helmet of salvation, correct, correct theology of what sal salvation is because the enemy will attack your brain. He will put fear in your heart. He will tell you you're no good. He will tell you God won't forgive you. He will tell you you're not saved. He'll, he'll make you doubt. And he'll hold anything against you and come against your mind, right? Are you with me? So the armor of God, and what is one piece of the armor? The word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. So if you want to be full of the Spirit, one of the ways you do it is by pouring in the Word of God. In thy law do I meditate, Psalm 1, day and night. He who meditates upon the, the law of God will be like a tree planted by the water, and it shall not be moved. It will be strong. Its roots will be deep. Do you see the analogies? Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Now in Luke 4, mark it down, verse 1 and verse 14. Luke 4, 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was, is it saying baptized by the Holy Spirit? Nope. It says Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days. Are you with me? In verse 14 of Luke 1, he says, he came back after the temptation, and he came back, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. You see it? You can get, turn your Bible quick. They're all right there. Acts, Luke, they're all right together. Luke 4, 1, Luke 4, 14. Was that baptized in the Spirit? What, how would we call that? Here's what I think it is. He's full of God. He walked with God. How did he get there? He fasted. You see, is there a difference between being filled with the Spirit or, bab or baptized in the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand if you think there's a difference in the two. Raise your hand. How raise your hand if you think there's no difference. Baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. You know I'm setting you up, don't you? Nobody's voting. Either that or you all got B.O. and you're not going to put your arms up. I don't know what that is. But doubt that's the case. I believe there is. Because Ephesians 5.18, I'm going to turn to it. You need to turn to it. I want you to look at it. Galatians, after the Corinthians, Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 18. Verse 17, to we'll start there. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding. Well, go back to 16, actually, to really get the picture. Sorry about that. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. In other words, you're living in times that are evil, you're living in times uh, that are difficult. You see verse 15, don't walk like fools, but be wise. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Where be not uh, unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the reason those are tied together is because what do we call the thing at the bar when drinks are half price? Happy hour. There's a scripture that talks about being full of faith, being full of grace, and being full of joy of the Holy Ghost. And you see it over and over. The things you see when you're being full of the Spirit is joy, faith, hope, it all refers to and full of the Holy Spirit. They're all tied together. And, and uh, so here he's saying, don't be drunk with wine. Words. That's just because that's what the people of the world go to to get their stress relief, to, to feel good, to be happy, to, to, to deal with the, uh, the, the, the evil days, the stressful days, the hard times. They run to the world system. And he's saying there's something better. Notice that on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they accused them. Some thought they were drunk when the Holy Spirit came. Remember that? Because the joy, the happiness, the hilarity that filled their hearts. And look at, you'll see it again here. Watch. It says, don't be drunk with the wine or his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. In other words, you, some hymns are sung to remind yourself and speak to yourself. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's speaking to you. That's encouraging. That's building up. 
that's reminding. If you want to really be happy, follow God, trust and obey. There's hymns and spiritual songs, songs that are given by the Spirit in the moment, that's sung from the heart with a new song. The, 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 the psalmist calls it a new song. And singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What is singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord? It is joy. You see, joy, the, the three, love, joy, and peace, they're mentioned more than anything else throughout Scripture when it talks about full of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? They're mentioned the most. And then it says, giving thanks always, as Pastor Hawkins talked about. It's the work of the Spirit. All things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this being full of the Spirit is something that says, be ye filled with the Spirit is something you do. It doesn't say wait on the Lord that the Holy Spirit would come and baptize you. It says you be filled with the Spirit. And that action, the verb there in the original language is meaning continuously action. As, as, uh, and I mentioned this in another sermon as Dr. Nunley spoke that we, le- we need a constant Holy Spirit going into us. So we teach our fifth graders that we have this water pool here and that we have to pour things in it that makes us spiritual and makes us strong. And if we pour stuff that makes us carnal and lustful and greedy and hateful and things like that, then we've poisoned our well, our water well. It's not worth drinking. There's no water to be shared. We wanna go out with springs of living. We wanna go out with fresh water, the waters of the spirit, because who doesn't love the fresh flowing spring, especially if it's flowing with power down, downhill, right? And so we'd say the eyes and the ears are the gates to what we put into our soul, into our well. And so there is a part that we play in being filled with the Spirit. We can do that. Let me give you an example. Now watch, in Acts chapter, uh, I'm gonna have to look right quick. I think it's Acts chapter six, where Stephen, where the, where, where the Bible tells them to pick uh, men that are full of the Holy Spirit. At verse six, it says, uh, verse three, Acts chapter six, I mean, verse three, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. They go hand to hand a lot. Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, look, a man full of faith, See how faith and of the Holy Ghost go to hand in hand. Where does faith come? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, there is an element by where we, are you getting it? Fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit. So that particular filling is our responsibility. Are you with me? Anybody yelling heresy yet? Okay. And that is an element where a lot of times people that have an experience of baptism, which is an experience, a power experience, then stop and they don't on an ongoing basis fill themselves with God, but they fill themselves with self and the pleasures of this world, right? So we'd rather read three magazines than one verse out of the Bible. The newspaper every day than a paragraph out of the scripture. We'd rather stop, study the stock markets than the Word of God. And I'm telling you, it will cause us to be weak. So that it also says of Stephen, I'm going to read it over here, over, over here again. The picking up after Stephen preached, and boy, he, he was in there, he was rattling their cage. And uh, in verse 54 of Acts 7, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Boy, they hated him. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Boy, there's some experiences we can have when we live our lives close and careful and circumspectly and wise and pursuing the presence and spirit of God and the truth of God and the call of God. He saw Jesus, the glory of God, and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. 
And then they, boy, that upset them. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, Stephen was calling to God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Sounds like, that's just like Jesus, wasn't it? That's what Stephen said. And look what Stephen did. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. Saul later says of him that the Holy Spirit was pricking him and that converted him and he became Paul. And the pricking of it is heart was this right here. Because Saul, Saul, Stephen behaved full of the Holy Spirit. You see, as witnesses, it's not just words to witness, but the power of God's Spirit in life and how we love and forgive, show grace and mercy, our speech being seasoned with grace, our hearts full of kindness, and if God is good and his loving kindness is better than life, then shouldn't we be good and loving kindness and, loving kindness and gracious and slow to anger and so forth and, and slow to speak and uh, swift to hear? We need to, to be full of the Holy Spirit. Over and over, we see this, that we're, people are full of the Holy Spirit. And then I do believe that we have a responsibility for that, whether you've ever had a moment where you felt like that there was a baptism of fire. Now the word baptized means to be immersed. And whether you believe or not doesn't matter to me what you believe about when you have an experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit as recorded in Acts 2 and that the Father promised. I see a pattern that when that took place that people were given a spiritual language to pray and to worship with not the gift to use in church, not, not, not the gifts, any of the gifts to use in church, but a moment where there was almost like a flood that opened up the realm of the eyes to see a moment like Isaiah experienced in Isaiah 6 where the glory of the Lord fills you and God's holiness overwhelms you. And I've had many Holy Spirit experiences. I know that when I was saved, while I had no intellectual understanding, that I was baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. I could not quit weeping or thinking of Jesus or being grateful. My whole thinking changed. My heart changed. I was saved. I was only eight years old, but I was baptized into the body of Christ by the same Spirit of God. And I want you to know there's power. You got a task. And I believe that the experience of the baptism, an experience, not something you do to fill yourself as a discipline, but the experience of a baptism of God's Spirit will give you power to accomplish the task at hand that God has given you. Simple men have done great things, for there are no great men, only simple men. And Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians that he's chosen the, the, the weak, the, 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 and the eyes of people, not noble, not strong, not, not known to be that intelligent, to confound the wise. He uses people by his spirit because after all, I can intellectually discuss this and talk you into believing anything. If I was smart enough, read enough, I could probably debate with anybody in the world and all of its intelligence have had debates after debates to debates after debates. And when someone wins the debate, it still doesn't change the heart of the person needing to lose the debate. I may make somebody lose a debate that needs Jesus, but it won't give them Jesus. It's by the Spirit they're born again. And if we're going to be accomplishing God's purpose, we need the power of the Spirit. And what I'm saying this, mo this, this evening is I believe there's a moment, if you are open to it, we're going to have a Holy Spirit week. We're going to have a time of the Holy Spirit to pray for people to have an experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And like I said before, I believe that the spiritual language that God wants to just like a, he offers, you offer, you say you, to your earthly father, I need, a, I need some fish. He's not going to give you a snake. I need bread. He's not going to give you a stone. I believe if it's good, and Paul says it's good, and the scripture is plain that it's beneficial and that it builds up, 
And it's important that a Holy Spirit language is something that all can experience. And I believe that there's a moment, an experience, uh, a, a happening when God's Spirit, like happened to Isaiah, when he fell on his face before God, the coals touched him, that the, and it hadn't happened, and that was the Old Testament equal, equal to it, I believe, for Isaiah. And the New Testament is totally different, but I believe there's a moment that that can happen for every person. I believe that. It doesn't make you first class. If you, if you have it, if you've experienced that and have a prayer language, it doesn't make you second class if you have it. That's not the point. And remember, I told you that when it happened the first time, they knew nothing about it. They didn't know anything. I'm telling you, suddenly it says, with power. And I'm telling you, when you get in the presence of God, you think Isaiah read somewhere about these seraphim, this happening, this shaking, this smoke. You know, we gotta put our, new, we gotta put our fake smoke up because God's smoke doesn't come. You know what I'm praying? that before I die in this sanctuary, that God fills this place with holy smoke. You believe it can happen? I do. I've seen angels as clear as day in the sanctuary over there. We were worshiping God, and all across the back by the area where it was, what do you call that? Soundproofed. I could just see angels. They were huge. And I could hear them singing. I went, there's nobody in our church that sings that good. Sorry, Erica, you're good, but you don't, you're not an angel. I mean, you are an angel in an earthly sense, but not a heavenly angel. I believe that God's spirit is real. And the least you can do is live a life where you pay more attention to the spirit and fill, filling with spiritual things than fleshly things so that you're more spiritual than you are carnal. God wants us to do that. And we get hungry and desiring. We open our eyes and we pray. Simple prayer, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. You see, I think he still comes upon people in miraculous ways. I think that he empowers people like he did temporarily with just certain individuals in the Old Testament for a task. He empowers everybody for the task that we have to go into all the world as his disciples, as his followers. And that's the, one of the questions, but why do you want the Holy Spirit? To be my witnesses? I'm gonna tell you, he says you will know them by their fruit, right? That fruit grows when we plant the right seeds in our heart, and that's up to us. The seed of this word bears fruit, folks with me? So there's, there's different things that go on, okay? So let me just summarize. The Holy Spirit, apart from anything that happened at Pentecost, just like in the Old Testament, can come upon you miraculously for a moment to do something amazing. The Holy Spirit can immerse you, totally engulf you, and give you a heavenly language to communicate to God in a way you've never communicated and experience God in a real way when it happened to me, trust me, the last thing I wanted is a spiritual language. I favored my dad. He was the guy that was like, I don't know about this. But I mean, it was suddenly. Nobody needs to teach anybody anything. I'm against, against it. I don't not for it. I'm not for trying to coach it. I'm not for trying to teach it. I'm not for trying to urge it. I'm for saying, get on your face, wait on God, wait on God and pray. And if it comes, it comes, but I believe it's real. Amen? I believe it's real. But what, what all of us can do, because that part is God's got to do that. Do you understand? You can't make yourself do that. That's where we get it wrong. God baptizes, Jesus does. But we can fill ourselves because he responds if we'll start doing the disciplines. And so tonight we're gonna practice discipline. So we're gonna sing a song, and when the song's over, we're gonna worship freely as, as the Holy Spirit would lead you. But I wanna show you some of the words uh, unknowingly. I, I didn't talk to y'all. Who picked the songs tonight? You guys? Boy, you were like <laughs> all over it. So run through the slides of all the songs tonight. Just go quickly. I want to just go over. I want, to see, I want you to see something. Because this, this is exactly, let the king of my heart be the mountain. Okay, keep going. 
Go to the next one. It won't move that good. Okay, go to the next song. That, that's a good song, but let's go to the next one. There's nothing worth more than ever come close, nothing that could compare. You're our living hope, your presence. You see, there's a presence among us. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence. There's something that happens when we're together in the presence of God. And Holy Spirit, someone told me, you know, just put that, put that, that note on your bedroom door. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere because that's one way God works, right? Is there, another, is there another verse of that? Your glory, God, is what my heart longs for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. And then right from Isaiah 6, here in your presence, Lord, I am undone, we sang, Right? That was, and then the, the, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. That's what I want to happen here. You see, it's like you, you can learn about it and you can know about it and you can read about it and you can be the, theologically okay on it. And I'm, maybe I'm off, you can correct me. Uh, that's fine. And, and let me, in case you didn't hear me clear, let me make it clear that you can refer to, because the Bible does, baptism of the Holy Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. It's the same thing in many contexts. Same thing. So that's why you have to say, have you been full, are you full of the Spirit? You've got to ask, well, what do you mean by that? And that's why I say, have you, have, you, have you experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You've got to say, well, what do you mean by that? Because we have to understand what that person's definition is that we're communicating, what they understand that to mean. But what I'm understanding tonight, what I want is I believe when you begin to pursue God, open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, fill your life with more of Him and more of His presence, delight in His presence, spend time in His presence, soak in His presence, go after God, guess what happens? He shows up. And He can show up in a way that's an experience that's beyond your ever comprehension. I told this story before, but I feel compelled, and some of you have heard it, but there's people that haven't heard it. I just feel very urged to tell you real quick, is that when this was going on that night, there were about 40 teenagers baptized in the Holy Spirit. One person that didn't know sign language was doing sign language and speaking in a spiritual language, and someone in our church who was not having any spiritual experience came over and began to watch and began out loud interpreting the sign language, which was all praise to God. It was all different praise phrases to God. I, I never seen anything like it. It's not in the Bible, but it happened. I saw it with my own eyes. And I heard people begin as the Spirit came upon them. Nobody was coaching them. Our pastor had gotten baptized the Holy Spirit. He was a Methodist, and he got kicked out of the Methodist church, particular Methodist church. They didn't want him in there. So he came, and he became, became our pastor because he had spoken in tongues and had this experience referred to by Jesus as the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire that happened in Acts 2. And, and I was standing over there and I'm, my theology is between my mom and my dad. My dad never said it wasn't, my dad just didn't know. And you know, he had his background from his Southern Baptist training and my mother had experienced it. And, uh, and so, but, but anyway, long story short, I just said, God, you know, if you, I mean, to, no emotion. If you, if you want anything from you, and this wasn't out loud even, just in my mind, if it's from you, I really want it. But I don't want anything that's not from you. I only want what's from you, God. I mean, seconds later, suddenly, with great power, the Holy Spirit just hit me almost like a semi. And not, not in a physical sense where I felt like getting hit, but I mean, I don't know how to explain it. It was just so powerful. And I began to speak with languages that I didn't know. And... and uh, and, and I spoke for about two hours. And an hour and a half of it, I was like this. I don't remember it, but they tell me I didn't move and my hands were up like this the whole time. Now I know I was young and I was a stud athlete, played basketball in high school, I was in high school. But nobody can do that for an hour and a half. It was supernatural. Yes, I'm Samson. I had a supernatural strength moment, right? I can't do that anymore. So I'm telling you, this thing is real. 
experiences with God are real, supernatural things are real, for God is supernatural, he is spirit, we are man, and we need more of him and his spirit and his presence, amen?